Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, this is Mountain Preacher and Jesus Podcast coming at you from Spokane, Washington. I'm excited. I'm actually nearing the end of this book, Freedom to Live Like Jesus, and it's been absolutely fun. I can't wait to continue with other subjects and topics. I have so many written down and ready to go, but um, I have two more chapters to go in this book, Freedom to Live Like Jesus. You know that I've encouraged you to get it. Uh, many times it's on Amazon. Um, it's 20 bucks. Um, it is over, you know, thought process and cap or uh, consuming notes and just all the stuff, ministry, helping people over the years. It's about a 25 year uh, process of putting all this together and um, finally putting it on paper so people can actually see the whole goal. <clears throat> is that there would be a discipleship manual out there that would be for discipleship and deliverance, um, taking care of just us maturing in Christ and coming to him and, and building this thing called relationship with Jesus and God and not a religious thing. And the reason I say that, because today's episode is going to be on what a true relationship with Jesus and the Lord looks like over a religious spirit or legalism, which is so common, not only uh, around the world and every um, a religion out there all has to do with legalism and trying to earn our way to God and look in the part. But in, in that's even in Christianity today and so many different denominations. But today is all about relationship versus religion or relationship versus legalism and the dangers of legalism and what religion and legalism create in the individual. And I could speak from experience on that personally. I've been a Christian for 30, almost 38 years now. And in my life, I really had to face the religious uh, spirit in me. Or when I say that, I don't mean a demon. I just mean just the attitude and my flesh and the spirit uh, of agenda behind wanting to become religious, looking the part, but actually not having our heart transformed from the inside out by the power and the love of the Holy Spirit. So I really want to focus on that today. It's going to be fun. I'm excited about it. Um, I do want to ask a question, like I've been asking uh, for the last few episodes, who are you helping in their relationship with Jesus. I'm excited about you being transformed. I'm excited about me encouraging you to go to Jesus in your relationship and allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God transform your life. But who are you helping? I've said this many times. I'm going to continue to say it. Most Christians, and I would say 98 point, 98 plus, if not 90 98, 99% of all Christians, they think the church somehow is making disciples of Jesus, which they are. I, I get that. But they look at, oh, the church is doing that. The church has a team for outreach. The church has a team for evangelism. The church has a team for deliverance ministry. The church has a prayer team, and the church has all these different teams. Well, those are all good things. I think they're all very appropriate. But those could all get lost in the shuffle of, are you, the individual, is Van actually helping somebody become more like Jesus through encouragement, through comfort, through uh, spurring them on, uh, praying for them, walking with them. And when they're stuck in something, am I, am I being a religious person by condemning them or putting shame on them? Or I'm saying, hey, yeah, I understand what you're going through with that particular issue in your life. Let me help you. Um, let's seek the Lord together in this. Um, so that's what I mean. Who are you helping through this book. So again, don't take that as a challenge. Take that as an encouragement because you are qualified. Let me say that again. You are qualified to help people through this book, um, Freedom to Live Like Jesus. My goal in life is to help people become more like Jesus so they can help others become more like Jesus. When I say that, uh, I'm looking at the inside. I'm looking at my inside. What are, what are the, the struggles that I've had in my life? What are the obstacles, the strongholds, which I went over in chapter 10? What are the strongholds in my life that I had to walk through 
repent of some things, forgive people of past things of them that hurt me? What have I had to walk through in order to have the Lord transform my heart from the inside out and not just wear better clothes or get a better haircut or look like this great Christian preacher that does all this kind of stuff. So people think I'm spiritual or say great things in the pulpit and all those, all those things we could hide are true inside if we just look good and look the part. So I want to encourage you today. We're going to talk about nurturing a relationship with Jesus above and beyond what a religious spirit would be or a legalistic spirit would be because legalism come straight from the enemy himself. He wants us to try to earn our way to God, to try to prove to God that we're good enough to be children of God. He wants us just to put all the focus on us helping ourselves to be more like God. And all the religions in the world, that's what they do. They do all these works and all these things to try to be good enough. True Christianity, and I, I really mean true Christianity, is completely opposite in true Christianity is 100% dependent upon the cross of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. He has all the power to work through us. It's not our power. It's not our strength. We are coming to him depending upon the Holy Spirit in our life and the word of God that we look at on a daily basis and depend upon the word of God. Let's get into a couple scriptures here. Again, uh, relationship over religion or relationship over legalism. This is Mountain Preacher coming from you from Spokane, Washington, and I'm excited. First scripture today is Matthew 23 in verse 27. It says this, Jesus rebukes the religious leaders saying, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones and of dead and everything unclean. Now, every one of us has the potential to be just like that explained by Jesus. We look good on the outside. So let me just be real with you. I, I want to be real. I want you to think through the things that we do as Christians. And I, again, I was guilty of this so many times through the years, been a Christian for 38 years. But how many times have you been in churches, maybe you grew up, and it doesn't really matter what denomination, it doesn't matter if it's Catholicism, Lutheran, Baptist, any kind of Pentecostal or charismatic denomination, doesn't matter what denomination it is, but how many times have you seen or felt, unless you look like the rest of the crowd, you don't fit in? And I'm telling you right now, that is exactly the kind of thing that Jesus rebukes all the time in the Gospels. You look good on the outside. You wear these things so you get recognized by people. You speak things on the corner of the streets. You do prayers. You, you wave bells or you wave smoke in the air. Whatever you do, you want people to think that you are close to God because you're doing certain things. And Jesus said, all those things are completely useless in your relationship to God. So if you're a part of a denomination, again, it doesn't matter what it is, that think that you can reach God because of a bell or because of some trinket that you have or necklace that you have or, or ritual that you do on a daily basis, all those things, all they do is make us more religious because they put in us, in our attitude, in our mind that if I do these things and the more I do these things, the closer I am to God, or not necessarily the closer I am to God, but the more God accepts me. Religion teaches you to do works to be accepted by God. Relationship with Jesus teaches us we are dependent upon our communion, our relationship, and our fellowship with the Holy Spirit in our life. It means that we're submitted to the Word of God. I don't depend on somebody in my life to read the Word of God for me and tell me what it means. I go to people and ask questions. I look at books and, and see what people have written about certain passages that I want more understanding on, but I don't depend on anybody to look at Scripture and go, oh, man, this pastor so-and-so or this priest so-and-so, 
he or she has it going on and I have to go to them to be able to connect to God. That's religion and legalism. And God says, don't do it. He's saying, lean on the rock of Jesus Christ. Come to me, Jesus says, and I am the one that will fellowship with you, the Holy Spirit within you. So if you're this far in the book and you're listening to this right now and you have a religious overtone in your life that you think you have to do certain things for God to accept you, I want to encourage you just to pause and repent of those things and say, you know what, I don't want religious things. I don't want to do acts in order for God to accept me. I want to know God. I want to know Jesus Christ, him and his crucifixion and his resurrection. I want to know that personally and how that affects my life, how he gives me direction and wisdom as I walk out this life as a maybe a young father or a young mother or maybe a single mother or a single father or maybe you're in your 40s or 50s or whatever you're at in life. Maybe you're a teenager and you're going, man, what is this? The whole world just seems like it's so stinking crazy. Everybody has their opinion about religion and what to do and what not to do. And there's the new age people over here that say, you know, depend on yourself, look within, and you're going to find all the answers within. And you have the, the warlocks and the witchcraft and the Wiccans over here that connect with earth, connect with the trees, connect with the water, connect with, with the atmosphere and listen to the wind and listen to all this kind of stuff. I've heard it all and I've seen it all. I've talked to people who've done all those things. And I'm telling you, the maker of the universe, God himself, the designer of you and me, who completely created the whole universe and everything within the universe wants to have a relationship with you where you can talk with him on a daily basis. You can read about him on a daily basis in his word. So I want to encourage you as we go, I'm going to give you some dichotomies about what religion and relationship look like. This won't be too long, but it's going to go through some things that hopefully help you out. Um, I read the scripture in Matthew 23 about Jesus rebuking the Pharisees. He would do and he does the exact same thing today to any pastor, to any priest, to any church leader that tries to get people to do things in order to be accepted by God. To be accepted by God, all you have to do is submit your life to him because he loves you. He doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because he created you and his design for you is to be in an intimate relationship with him. And you don't have to do anything to do that except receive by faith his grace and love in your life and the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the key of all Christianity, that we would depend and receive the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, as our king and as our savior and as our Lord. That's who he is. He is not an angel. He is not a brother of the enemy. He is not anything. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the alpha and omega. Jesus Christ is the beginning and the end, and we completely depend on him. And he invites us into this relationship that will blow your mind every day because that's who he is. He's God. And he wants to live inside of you and, and have this relationship with you. So here's another one that I've read this many times over the over these podcasts, but Jesus in, in Matthew 11, verse 28 says this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Now, I just told you that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and, and all those things. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. But yet he comes and he says this, lean on me, for I am humble, and you're going to find rest for your souls. The maker of the universe comes to you directly right now and says, come to me, take upon me, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace and joy in your life. You're struggling and you're striving to be good. And Jesus is saying, you will never be good enough for me. I'm the one who died and was buried and was raised from the dead 
on your behalf. I did this so you could have a relationship with me. So come to me and I'm going to give you rest and peace and joy in the power of the Holy Spirit and teach you to quit striving to do good things to be accepted by God. So let's just dig into this really quick. What are some dichotomies? Religion versus relationship. Uh, how about legalism versus grace? I'm going to read something here, then go over a couple of scriptures. Legalism versus grace. Man-made religion often emphasizes strict adherence to external rules and regulations as a means of achieving righteousness or earning God's favor. This legalistic approach can lead to a rigid and judgmental mindset where one's worth is based on performance rather than on the grace of God. In contrast, a relationship with Jesus is founded on grace, recognizing that salvation is a gift freely given by God through faith in Christ Jesus, which we, we know that in Ephesians 2 and many other scriptures as well. Watch out for legalistic teachings that place undue emphasis on rules and regulations, neglecting the transformative power of God's grace. Relationship is all about us receiving what Jesus Christ did. We repent of our sin. We repent of our lifestyle. Christ comes in. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is clearly stated in Scripture. And through that point forward, it's God's love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his redemption in our life that begins to transform our hearts. So our actions begin to change based on our heart condition. Religion is we try to change our actions on the outside so people think we're doing good, but our heart remains solid stone and does not change. That's the difference between a pharisaical hypocrite, religious person, and someone who is born again, whose God is transforming them from the inside. Their heart is becoming soft, aware of the goodness of God, and we're being transformed by God's love and mercy and power. A couple of scriptures to go with that is Matthew 12, uh, or Matthew 9, verse 12 says this, and when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus requires mercy, not a sacrifice. Now, do our lives sacrifice to him overall? Absolutely. He's not talking about that. He's talking about, you can't bring me a sacrifice in order for me to accept you. Our flesh and religion says, hey, if you carry this trinket around, or if you pray this particular prayer every day or several times a day, or if you take communion this way, thinking that you're actually eating the blood and the, and the, the flesh of Jesus, if you do that, you're going to be all right. And all that is a religious facade that says, do these acts and God will accept you which is completely what Jesus rebukes. Jesus says, fall on me, the rock. Come to me, the one who can give you rest. And I'm going to live inside of you, and your heart's going to transform from the inside out. Religion, again, does not transform the heart. It actually hardens the heart and makes us more self-righteous. In Luke 18... Verse 9, it says this, and it's a little bit lengthy here, but it's really important. Then Jesus told the story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everybody else, talking about a lot of us today, right? Religious people or hypocrites who want to do religious acts, right? And then verse 10, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector or a sinner, and that's all of us, right? The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I certainly not like a tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. 
I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you the sinner or this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, probably the best scripture in all of the Bible is this one right here that I just read. And again, I just want to make sure you hear that. It's in the book, obviously, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. A sinner and a tax, a tax collector sinner and a Pharisee go to the altar and pray. One stands up and says, look at me, O Lord. I'm just glad I'm not like other people. Let me ask you a question. How many people do you know that are like that? Are you like that sometimes? Oh, God, thank you so much that I'm not like the other sinners, right? Um, that is a part of us. It can be a part of us. And if we have this self-righteous religious spirit, that's the heart behind our prayer. God, thank you. I go to this church, but man, I'm not going to talk to half the people in my church because well, they're just not like me. We're not on the same page. We're not in the same atmosphere. We grew up differently. Therefore, I'm not going to connect with those people because, you know, they really don't look the part. That's the hypocritical Pharisee that is religious and legalistic. The sinner, the tax collector, the one says, Lord, oh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I am a sinner. I can't even look to you because I'm humble right now that I can even get to talk to you because you are the king of kings. I, I repent of my sin. That is a true Christian, always growing, always maturing, always being humble. And when we, when we can get prideful, obviously, when we do, we repent. Lord, I've been prideful. I'm sorry. I repent of my heart right now. My agenda has been kind of self-righteous and prideful. Lord, I repent of that in Jesus' name. So a true Christian stays in this thing that I call practice in repentance, that we're always asking the Holy Spirit to check our heart, to evaluate our heart. Is there anything in me that is creating a religious spirit or a legalistic spirit where I think that I'm better than somebody else? The next one is a heart transformation versus an external appearance. This is huge. Even in today, in our culture today, it's huge. And a lot of you listening to my voice right now were raised in something that, that's very man-made external appearance. Uh, man-made religion tends to prioritize outward appearance and religious rituals over genuine heart transformation. Jesus warned against the hypocrisy of religious leaders and focused on external piety uh, while neglecting matters of the heart. In Matthew 23, um, I already read this one, but it's important. What are you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? Or actually, I haven't read this one yet. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleans or clean or cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside of them may be clean also. So Jesus is just really saying this. It's easy to clean the outside, it's easy to buy the clothes, go in debt, buy the clothes, get the right vehicle, look the part, and that has nothing to do with the inside of your heart. Jesus is saying this, cleanse the inside of your heart. Come to the Lord. Come to Jesus. Seek him. Allow him to evaluate your heart. And he is gentle, and he is humble, and he is full of mercy. He is full of grace, and he'll say, Van, in this area or in the last couple of weeks or a few weeks or the last couple of months, you've been doing this and it's, it's a sin against your family or your spouse or your wife. Um, and, and it's a sin against me. You need to not do that. And when the Holy Spirit comes in and says those things to me or to you, we go, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. And then if we've offended or hurt somebody or sinned against somebody, we need to go to that person and say, you know what? I've been acting like this and I apologize um, I didn't mean to do that. I just been doing that. And I, I'm sorry for doing that. You know, I've been a pastor for a long, long time been a Christian for, uh, again, almost 38 years. And I had an elders meeting in our church um, right now. It's just the beginning of November. I think it was near August, somewhere in there. I think it was August. And, um, and I said some things in the elders meeting that weren't derogatory to anybody in the room, but they were just, it was just the wrong spirit and just behind what I said. And I, I didn't mean to, it just, for some reason, it was just in my heart. And I said something 
And that night my wife goes, you know, do you know what you said? And, and I kind of evaluated what I said and how I said it. And I go, yeah, you're right. I, I definitely came with the wrong um, attitude in that area. And I shouldn't have like that night I text all the elders and I said, Hey, today at the meeting, I just want to apologize what I said and how I said it was wrong. I apologize. Didn't mean to do that. Certainly wasn't justifying it, but I just said, I'm sorry for saying that. And uh, we have a great leadership team here at Livingstone Church, and they appreciated that. So if we do something wrong, a true Christian faces up to what we do wrong and says, you know what, I repent of that. And I'm sorry, especially if you have hurt or sinned against somebody to go and say, yeah, my heart wasn't right in that area. Um, another scripture is Galatians 5.22, with the fruit of the Spirit, and this is always one of the best ones in scripture that you could always go to. It's love and joy and peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, and this is awesome against such. There's no law. In other words, this is not legalism. It's not a law. The joy, when you have the Holy spirit in your life, you produce these things. And when you're not producing love and joy and peace and, and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, when you're not producing those things, the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, Van, what's going on? What's There's something going on. I mean, the, they, the Holy Spirit always knows what's going on in my heart and your heart. But he challenges and encourages me to say, hey, you're not being gentle or you're self-controlling in this area or whatever it is. The Holy Spirit is saying there needs to be a change. And that change comes from the heart. So relationship with Jesus is a heart transformation Religion and legalism is external appearance. When I when my, when I do something wrong, whether it's somebody in the church or somebody outside the church or a family, whatever it is, I could look the part and go, look at me, I'm the pastor or I'm the leader or I'm this. And, and I could rub that off in pride and say, well, I, I'm all right. That is religion. That is creating a religious spirit or a legalistic spirit that is only going to produce death. Or I can be, where's my heart in that situation? Was I kind? Was I gentle? Or did I have self-control? Or was I loving in that area? If I wasn't, then I need to repent and allow the Holy Spirit to adjust my heart and me not trying to look good on the outside. Another dichotomy of religion and legalism versus um, <clears throat> true relationship is control versus freedom. Again, this is a huge one. In our current society today, uh, control versus freedom. Man-made religion often seeks to control behavior and thought patterns through rigid rules and regulations. This control can stifle individuality and hinder genuine spiritual exploitation and growth. In contrast, a relationship with Jesus brings freedom and liberation from the bondage of legalism and religion. Now, I want to be fair here in that as a Christian, someone who has the Holy Spirit inside of me who wants to please, not please people in the sense of fear of man, but I want to, I want to be gentle and I want to be kind. I want to be loving toward people and I want to please the Lord and be faithful to the Lord. I do have this thing that, that I want to please the Lord. I want to be faithful to him. So when I do wrong, I do want to change. But the last thing I want to do is control anybody in the church. And I've seen it done. I've been tempted to control, manipulate as a pastor. And I can tell you right now that everybody in the world that's been a pastor that is a pastor has been tempted to, to manipulate and control people through different things in the church, the rules and regulations that we do. So is it there in ev the potential of everybody? Yes, everybody has the potential to manipulate and control, but our job as Christians, especially leaders, is to bring people to freedom. Now, that doesn't mean that we get to go and do whatever the heck we want and, and sin and do all those kind of things. If we sin, we need to repent. It means that I want to point you right now, the person listening to my voice, I want to point you to Jesus and his word. I want to encourage you and exhort you and comfort you to go to Jesus. He's the king. He's your Lord. He's your master. What does the word of God say? And when you go in the word and read through like some of the scriptures I've been reading to you right now, 
when you go in and read those things for yourself, you're going to be transformed. Your mind's going to be transformed to become more like the mind of Christ. And when that happens, there's inner transformation. And when there's inner transformation, there's always going to be outer transformation. You're going to look different to people. People are going to go, wow, and in the last year, you changed a lot. You just, for some reason, you're more kind. You're, 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 you're a lot more gentle than you used to be. Those are heart transformation things. When we try to transfer ourselves and look good on the out, on the outside and have control and not, not want God or people on the inside of us, people see that right away. They go, eh, Van's not changing at all. He says these things, but I don't really true, see true actions in his life. That means there's no heart transformation. That means I'm just putting up a bigger facade in my life. And I want to control people to think that I'm doing good when I'm really not. A couple of verses that go along with control versus freedom. Uh, Galatians 1.5, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Bondage always makes us look religious and want to be in control. Where freedom, Jesus wants us to be free to live like him in joy and peace in all the fruits of the spirit that I just mentioned above. John 10, 10, the thief goes, <clears throat> or the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. Jesus is all about giving you more life, more Holy Spirit in your life as we pray, look at the word, meditate on his word, and, and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to continually fill us on a, on a daily basis, which is what the Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter 5, that we would be filled, continually filled with the Holy Spirit, especially as we read the God, read the Word of God. Those things are just in a combination. Um, I believe you got to have both of those things. Um, so it's important that we get the life of Jesus on the inside of us and not try to create a facade on the outside so we look the part of being a Christian. What does that even mean? That a, How is a Christian supposed to look? A Christian is supposed to look like this, like Jesus did. Love, compassion, uh, praying for people, serving people, honoring people, even our enemies, even the ones that don't like us, we still honor and respect people in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Religion creates, there's another dichotomy, religion creates isolation and, and, and true True fellowship or true relationship with Jesus creates community, true community. Man-made religion may foster a sense of exclusivity or elitism leading to isolation from those who do not adhere to the same beliefs or practices. This can create an environment where judgment and division flourishes, undermining the essence of Christian love and community. In contrast, a relationship with Jesus emphasizes community and fellowship with others. It's really that simple. And this is difficult. I'm just going to be honest with you. Because when you start coming together with people that you didn't grow up around, that weren't your cousins or your brothers and sisters or family, and you start connecting with them, they're going to be different. They're going to do things differently. They're going to raise their kids a little bit different how you raise your kids. They have a little bit different values, but they're brothers and sisters in Christ and because we have the same Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches us or commands us to be in harmony and unity with each other. That doesn't mean we agree on everything. That doesn't mean we do everything the same. That means I honor you and you honor me. I get asked this a lot and talked a lot, uh, uh, a lot about this over the years with different people. You know, people coming to the church where I pastor, me and my wife pastor, and it's like, well, what do I call you? Do I call you Pastor Van, or do I call you, what do, what do I call you? And I just, you know, call me Van. That's my name. That's, that's what my mom and dad gave me, Van. Just call me Van. You don't need to call me Pastor. If you feel you do, go ahead. Um, well, what about honoring you? Um, and I always say this, I want you to honor me as much as I honor you. And they go, what? I want you to honor me as much as I honor you. In other words, if I don't give you honor and respect, it doesn't matter if I'm a church leader, a pastor, it doesn't matter who I am. If I don't give you honor and respect as an individual, someone that's created in the image of God, 
I shouldn't expect you to honor me just because of a title. That's ridiculous. So I hope that makes sense. Now, we just had an election in our country, and uh, the red team won this time. Um, and personally, I'm happy. Yes, I think I'm, I'm definitely side with a lot of things over there. But I have so many friends, especially on social media, that are on the opposite end of the aisle. And we're not talking just the opposite end. We're talking staunch opposite end, hate the red team, blah, blah, blah. And I've been a part of the red team that, uh, and again, I'm not a republic. I'm not registered to anything because I can't stand either party. But um, what I'm saying is this. I love and respect everybody, whether you disagree with me on politics or anything, because you're made in the image of God. That is how we are supposed to look at each other. Respect and honor because you are made in the image of God. You are created by God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm going to honor and respect you. I'm going to love you. If Jesus was a religious leader that said, you know, born a Jew in Israel, blah, blah, blah. And he went around to the to the Samaritan woman in John chapter four and said, no, nope, the Jews right now are enemies with Samaritans. You're also a woman. Therefore, I'm not going to talk with you, I'm not going to speak to you because you are a piece of dirt. You're a Samaritan and you're a woman. Therefore, Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do that to the tax collector. Matter of fact, Matthew, who was a tax collector, became one of his disciples Jesus went to people because he wanted to see them born again and saved. All people, Jews and Gentiles. And that's the whole story of the whole Bible through Abraham, that Jews and Gentiles would be saved through the grace and the loving, the love of Jesus Christ. Um, so community versus isolationism. When, how many of you have been to a church where it's like, man, they're just, again, all churches have cliques. You can't get away with that. It's just nature, okay? But I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying you got to be aware of that. But a lot of churches have not only cliques, but elitism. Like, if you're going to be a part of this crowd, man, it's like you got to join this club to be a part of it. The All these kind of things are complete anti-Bible in the sense of who Jesus Christ is. If, Like I said, if Jesus was like that, hey, you got to belong to this clique, or to get in, you have to do these things, he wouldn't have talked to any individual in his days. He certainly would have went to a, a demon-possessed person or a blind person who had no money, a person who was sick, or a person who had leprosy. All those things, Jesus would have avoided all those people if he was a religious person who wanted to say, in order to come to me, you got to join the clique. No, he didn't do that. He went to everybody and offered them salvation through him. Hebrews 10, 24 says this, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. <clears throat> so as a New Testament Christian church, a church is everybody in the world that is a Christian, that is a true born-again Christian. As we go about in our societies, we are to love and not isolate people based on who they are, where they come from, or anything like that. I want to end with this verse that's just a, a very powerful verse. The whole uh, chapter of John 17 is, is extremely powerful, but this is amazing. <clears throat> this is the heart of God towards you. If you've gone through this book now, Freedom to Live Like Jesus, and there's still things that you're dealing with, or you're wondering, does God love me? And man, I've done so many bad things, and it, can I get in? And the enemy continues to bar, just barrage you with these thoughts of you're not good enough, and you'll never amount, and you don't do the things. If you enter a church, you're going to be set on fire, and all those things are funny things, but they're really, they're true things in our heart that we walk through. Check this verse out. This is amazing. Uh, and this is just part of Jesus's prayer to the Father. Uh, John 17 and verse 20, starting there. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So Jesus is saying, Father, you and I are one with each other. We're in each other. We're one. Jesus is saying, I want 
this relationship with anybody that ever calls upon my name, Jesus Christ, I want them to understand that they are in us, me and the Father, just like the same relationship that the Father and me have. You got to ponder that. You got to think about that. because That is one of the most powerful things that the Bible can actually encourage you in. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I might, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. So now Jesus is saying two things. They're going to be one with us, in us, and then they're going to be one together as the church because they all have the same spirit, which obviously the, the, the Bible teaches that throughout, especially the New Testament. I in them and you in me, and they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me. And now check this out. This is so amazing. And have loved them as you have loved me. If you don't think God loves you, go to the book of John chapter 17. I just read you verses 20 through 23. And the last part of 23 says this. You have sent me and you have loved them as you have loved me. God the Father loves you, whether you are a sinner right now and not a Christian, or whether you are a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit in your life. God the Father loves you the same way he loves his own son, Jesus Christ. That should open up something in you to realize that whatever you whatever has been spoken over you over the years, negativity, which most of us grew up around negativity in our life, the Father is speaking to you right now. Out of the Word of God, John chapter 17, God the Father loves you the same as he loves his Son, Jesus Christ. That should encourage you. That is something that you can go look at in the in John 17. That's something you could meditate on. That is something you could ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten you, to give you revelation on how much God loves you as an individual. You are loved by God because he created you. He has a purpose for you. Yes, he wants you to repent of your sin and come to him and lean on Jesus, fall on the rock of Jesus Christ to be delivered and set free so you could live like Jesus Christ. But God the Father loves you so much that he hung his own son on a cross that you might be saved. That is the relationship I'm talking about compared to religion and um, not sacrifice compared to religion and um versus relationship. God the Father loves you, designed this relationship for us. So let's get rid of legalism and religion, and let's cling on to relationship with the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, because they love us so much. This is Mountain Preacher and Jesus encouraging you that you are loved by God because he designed you, he created you, he has a purpose for you. That purpose is to come to him and repent, follow Jesus Christ, and he will guide your life as you lean on him. Be blessed today. Mountain Preacher signing out. Until next time.